we got a couple of presentations today uh, and then we've got time on the agenda for discussion on this topic and, and talking about next steps and thoughts from, from everyone on the line today that's been able to join us. We will have presentations from COG. Uh, Lori and I will be doing a short overview of kind of a little bit of a history lesson on how we have got to today and what we will be looking to maybe do over the next uh, 18 months to two years uh, with an EPA grant that we will be uh, receiving, COG will be receiving. And then we will also have three presentations from the one from the Dallas Fort Worth International Airport. Chris Russell uh, will be doing an update on a study that they have have recently completed on this topic of food waste and anaerobic digestion and RNG. And then Toyota Motor Toyota Motor North America Matt Sheldon will be doing a, a presentation also on a study that they have recently completed. And then the University of Texas uh, Dr. Melanie Sattler will be providing a, a short brief on um, a tool uh, and a model that her team of students and herself have developed over the last few years, looks at food weight, using food waste as a, as a feedstock and anaerobic digestion, and then using that uh, as RNG uh, for vehicle fuel. So, and, and it's a very comprehensive database uh, that they have developed with a whole lot of attributes and, and computations in it. Um, cost benefit analysis and, and whatnot. So she'll be covering an overview of that because that is that is one uh, element of our future grant that we will be working to incorporate and use in a more regional format. And I'll, I'll talk about that briefly here in just a little bit. Uh, and then we do have a little bit of time on our agenda for just discussing ongoing regional uh, collaborations or opportunities on this particular topic and just having some discussion time for our region uh, and our stakeholders that are on the line. So with that, thank you everyone for including your information in the chat. This is awesome. I'm just taking a quick peek at who we've got on the line. So we have a very good group of private sector, sustainability folks, public sector, sustainability folks, uh, wastewater universities, very, very good group here. So that's excellent. So um, this roundtable, the Food Waste, Anaerobic Digestion, and RNG roundtable, is it's very informal. Uh, this is not a formal presentation at all. This, this was really put together as a result of a conversation that COG recently had with Toyota, um, where we learned about their efforts that they are working on in this, in this space, in, the, in this topic area, coupled with also the same, a similar study, perhaps, that the airport was doing. And, and then an effort that COG was, was undertaking with a grant um, that we have recently been awarded. And we just felt like, based on that conversation with Toyota, that it was kind of the, the, I don't want to call it the stars were aligning, but things were kind of coming together from a regional perspective and different partners looking at this topic. And we actually also have some funding under our State Energy Conservation Office grant contract that we have and SECO is is on the line today so we're great we're very grateful that they were able to join us today for this conversation as well so we have a little bit of money to to kind of focus on building this topic and host some roundtables in our region and so we just felt like the the time was right to start these conversations um, and wanted to try to get something in before the holidays so we are hopeful that this is the first of several um, roundtables or stakeholder meetings that we will be having over the course of the next year at a minimum and just see where that takes us over time. Uh, Lori, do you, from the transportation side, have any kind of perspective that you want to add just as a kind of a high level overview of how we got here? I'll cover that in my part of the overview presentation. Sounds great. So I'm going to jump forward to our presentation then if you're ready to get started, Lori. Um, we'll just jump right in. COG, for those that are on the line that, that don't know um, what our organization is, I wanted, we wanted to spend just a few minutes to really talk about what are we and what, what we aren't. We are a quasi-governmental voluntary association of local governments. So our member governments, counties, cities, ISDs, special districts, water districts, those are our member organizations. And so that is who we primarily serve and we provide services on their behalf. Um, for our 16 county region that is in the blue area there on, on the state of Texas map. And we have no regulatory authority. I, I think that's probably one of the most important things to point out about our organization 
is that we have no taxing authority, we have no regulatory authority, everything we do is voluntary and through engagement and coordination and collaboration. So I think that's important to just make sure that everybody understands that, especially as we're talking about this, this topic. And we are fourth largest metro area in the US. Um, and when you really think about that uh, in the way that we all know that we're growing and will be growing in the future, opportunities um, and innovative opportunities that maybe our region hasn't addressed or looked at as potential um, opportunities is something that from several different um, elements and perspectives and goals is important to continue to do as we look to plan ahead and make sure that we are able to provide services for our region for the long term and, and for all those future people that aren't even here yet in our region and businesses um, for that matter. So it's important for us to keep those items in mind um, as we talk about potentially hard things that are maybe theoretical um, in nature, but without those kind of ideas and, and those collaborations and planning ahead for the future, I guess I guess we wouldn't exist. That is what we do. <laughs> so at COG is to help our member governments do those things with partnerships. So why is COG interested in this topic of food waste and, and anaerobic digestion and, and um, RNG, uh, renewable natural gas? We have a lot of challenges in our region, as most of you on the phone are aware. We have landfill capacity constraints that all of us work within. And as the Regional Solid Waste Planning Agency, COG, this is a, a kind of a daily thing that we work on, whether it's promoting recycling activities or doing all sorts of other public education grant funding to our local governments to help them with their own waste management challenges, but it all comes back to preserving our landfill capacity in our region because currently we have about 36 years combined between all of the landfills in our region of remaining capacity. So uh, when you think about um, over that time frame of 36 years, we're going to be about 11 million people in the next 36 years. Planning for that new capacity that we know that we will need is a very long term <laughs> a very long-term planning effort. So we are currently working on several efforts uh, related to, to looking at landfill capacity in our Western part of our region in particular that is very limited. So anything that we can do to divert materials uh, from the landfill is always a positive thing. And one of the things that we have recently learned through an audit, a regional audit, is that 50% of our waste stream in North Central Texas from household, household waste stream that's important to, to make clear, is organic waste. And about 31% of that 50% is food waste. So we have a tremendous amount of food going into just our household um, waste stream that could be a potential opportunity to, to work, work with um, in a more productive manner, perhaps. So diverting this food waste and other organics, whether that's uh, yard waste or other things that are going into the waste stream uh, and, and really doing outreach on that element is one, one thing that we do already do, but we want to be able to look at what are other opportunities that, that we have for that waste. Also, in, in terms of waste water treatment plants, um, biosolids management is always something that for a region our size and treating wastewater um, is a challenge. And so there might be opportunities looking at the topic of, of anaerobic digestion and combining that for soil amendments and, and whatnot. Um, there's, there's some things there that we could perhaps consider as, as a benefit or a tangential benefit to, to this topic area. Producing biogas and renewable energy uh, some and, and using that as a fleet fuel. That's another um, area that Lori's team works very heavily on, and she will be covering that um, here shortly. But that's another opportunity to look at what, what more can we be doing. Dallas has a climate plan where they've got some renewable energy goals, and so does the airport. So do a lot of our cities. Um, so what are opportunities there that we could help look at addressing uh, long term? Of course, then greenhouse gas emissions and meeting zero waste goals that some of our cities have and other sustainability goals that many of our cities and private um, private sector partners have. So um, kind of quickly going through a biogas assessment that COG did. This, this kind of is a historical look at how we got to today. Under our last SECO contract, COG actually did look at um, a biogas, a set, we did a biogas assessment and we pulled together a lot of data. It is very heavily focused at this point in time on landfill 
um, methane capture projects in our region. We, we kind of wanted to take it a little bit farther and get more into the RNG elements, but we really, once we started digging around and getting data and collecting information, we, we figured out pretty quickly that we had bit off more than we could chew with, with the time and resources that we had available to do this. So it was kind of a first phase and really looked at the, the current state of biogas practices and, and production in our region. The website at the bottom is the link to this report that is, there's a picture of it on the, on the side here of the slide, but it really provides a foundation for us to build upon in the future. So we have a lot of data that we've collected on the landfill side. We would like to get more data from the wastewater treatment side for those projects that are currently operating in our region. That's part of the, part of the next kind of phase that we would go into. But ultimately looking at how can we build on this to perhaps look at future renewable natural gas projects? I, I'm not going to read all of this, um, but I did include it in the presentation because I think it's important to define what COG in our, in our biogas assessment white paper, what we actually define biogas and renewable natural gas as. Um, we did a lot of comparison across industry. This may not match what every entity considers to be renewable natural gas, but for purposes of this discussion today, it's biomethane that's upgraded to natural gas pipeline quality standards. So that's pretty standard across the industry, but that's that's where in, in what we're doing. So the outline of our report, I'm not going through the report in detail today. I think it's about 25 pages or so. A lot of it's maps and, and data, but we covered the biogas production processes, um, climate impacts, economic benefits of the biogas collection, transportation sector benefits from uh, renewable fleet vehicles. Uh, then we looked at natural, the North Central Texas biogas production, again, landfill methane gas capture projects in our region, and then looking at the existing anaerobic digestion uh, facilities as well in our region. And we talked a lot more about each of those items in more detail. And then we also conducted a biogas survey uh, of all of our um, landfills and wastewater treatment plants. And there's a lot of wastewater treatment plants in the North Texas area. And so we feel like we have somewhat of a representative sample of kind of what how things currently stand in our region. Um, and kind of the, the feelings uh, of our region and, and our members in terms of this topic in general of anaerobic digestion and biogas production. And so then we also in the white paper look at regional opportunities for further advancement of RNG projects. So just a quick overview of what we learned on the landfill gas capture side. We have 25 registered landfills um, that are actively doing gas recovery in our region. Oh, sorry, in the state. Sorry, I was like, that sounds high. In the state, um, nine in our region. So out of the 25 total landfills in the region, there are nine that are doing active recovery landfill gas, um, in landfill gas recovery in our region. And over time, over the last, well, the latest report that TCEQ had at the time was from 2018. So over that seven year period, we had 45% increase in our region in landfill gas captured or excuse me, process. So that's a pretty huge jump. And that's the top graph on the right there, um, the gray graph. And so you can really see from 2011 to 2018 how, how much that it improved. You know, new projects came online uh, and started collecting landfill gas. And so the numbers went up. And then there was a 250% increase in gas distributed offsite between that same time. And in terms of the power generated from these types of projects in our region, there was really no clear trend, as you can see from the bottom right slide, it's kind of going up and down. Um, we were not able to dig into the why of that. It may be based on price, it may be based on a whole lot of you know, equipment, it may be based on a whole lot of different things. And, and some projects actually came on and went offline um, during those, those time periods as well. So there's a lot of factors that probably weigh into the generation and, and the, uh, how much was sold um, during those times. Uh, and then getting kind of on the anaerobic digestion side of things, there are currently eight wastewater treatment plants in our region um, that have a biogas production component. All of these are major plants in our region that, that have these type of facilities. And most of the, the energy is used for on-site electricity generation. So it's going back into their operations um, to help fuel their operations. 
So that some examples uh, are the Dallas Southside Wastewater Treatment Plant, the Fort Worth Village Creek Plant, and Denton Pecan Creek Wastewater Treatment Plant. So um, that's just a few that we um, provided some links to case studies and whatnot for our region, but there are more than just those three um, that are currently collecting or producing biogas. So uh, as I had mentioned, we also did a survey just to kind of test where our region was on, on this topic. And we did a survey of all the landfills and major wastewater treatment plants as part of this white paper. And we got several data points back that really indicated that we're on the right track and that there is support in our region for working together to further develop, develop partnerships to implement future RNG projects or focus on this more. And then I'm not going to read all of these findings and next steps. We will post this presentation so you can go back and look at all of these. But as a result of during this white paper production and why we were working on this, we really took away that there was a whole lot of opportunity and looking at other areas around the nation and what they are doing, some mandatory requirements related to organics collection and all the different types of partnerships that are being formed across the nation, and then partnerships with our transportation department and looking at opportunities on the RNG side and vehicles, it really became apparent that there are a lot of next steps that could be undertaken in our region. So this is just a basic inventory of what we think could be done. And then consequently, also during production of this white paper, the EPA released their EPA grant and it was spot on with what we were, were learning from our solid waste team and food waste efforts, our transportation efforts. And then we, we just really felt like this was an opportunity based on the survey that we did to maybe advance this conversation further in our region. So with that, I'm going to leave it um, with, with Lori to just quickly cover the transportation side. Thank you, Tamara. So, um, in case in case you're wondering why somebody from the transportation department is here, so one of the major programs that we have uh, in the transportation department is called Dallas Fort Worth Clean Cities. So we serve as the local boots on the ground coalition, which is for our region. Uh, we're one of nearly a hundred coalitions across the country. This is a program out of the Department of Energy, under their Vehicle Technologies Office. And it's really all about um, reducing emissions, improving efficiency in the transportation system, and it includes all of the strategies that you see here. So alternative fuels is one of those key strategies, and of course, renewable natural gas fits into that spectrum of alternative fuels um, as, a, as a somewhat easy drop-in replacement for conventional compressed natural gas. And of course, we're interested in being able to transition the fleets that are already using compressed natural gas in our region over to renewable natural gas as much as possible so that we can get those extra those extra air quality benefits in terms of climate and greenhouse gas reductions you know while maintaining the cleaner emissions on the criteria pollutant side that we're worried about when we talk about ozone public health and particular um, so one of the major metrics that we use to gauge the impact of the Dallas Fort Worth Clean Cities program, and, and I should have included these numbers in this presentation, it slipped my mind, so I'm looking at them on my other screen right now. But one of the major impacts that we look at is how many gasoline gallon equivalent of petroleum consumption has been offset by use of alternative fuels in the region. And in 2019, compressed natural gas used in transportation fleets, and this is only the transportation fleets that actually reported their data to us, was over 15 million gasoline gallon equivalent. So that's a very large a very large volume of compressed natural gas being used in the transportation system already by people who are actually self-reporting to us that we could potentially see as a market for renewable natural gas. A little bit of that already is renewable, thanks to, to DFW Airport. It's part of why they're one of the presenters today. But when we look at the impact of that um, compressed natural gas use, less than 5% of the vehicles reported to us were renewably uh, powered by renewable natural gas. That less than 5% of the vehicles accounted for more than 20% of the total greenhouse gas emission reductions attributable for all of the activities that we reported in 2019. So it makes a really big impact. Um, so again, just um, giving some kudos to DFTV Airport. I know they're not the only fleet in our region using renewable natural gas, but um, there is a case study on what they're doing thus far. It's linked at our website, which you can see there. So you can go and download that, um, but it is sourced from one of those methane projects that Tamara 
cited and is, is part of their strategy towards uh, carbon neutral. So hopefully I'm not stealing too much of their thunder. With that, I think that's all I have in terms of my slides. Mm -hmm. um, so just wanted to, to make that connection of, of how this fits in as we develop that renewable natural gas um, potential transportation could be one of those markets. And so um, that's the role that, that my team and I would play in this whole initiative as we move forward. And certainly if there's other people that should be involved, um, please let us know. Great, thanks, Lori. Okay, so that takes us to kind of the wrap up here for, for the COG perspective and the regional perspective. So what, what are we doing from here? We are going to be undertaking, um, probably starting in the spring, an EPA grant uh, that we received to, to do a North Central Texas food waste to fuel feasibility study. And this is a high level overview of, of the scope um, that we included, but essentially it's to advance regional efforts in this space to divert food waste from landfills, preserve landfill capacity, look at our renewable uh, energy opportunities, uh, and evaluate the potential to reduce fleet emissions, which is what Lori was just talking about. So it's really kind of merging all of those three concepts together. And looking specifically at supply, where would we get supply of food waste? What is already in our region, either pre and post consumer and, and do a market assessment of, of where, where those are, whether it's ag, food, dis food distribution centers, there's a whole range of, of, of elements in that supply category that we want to look at and address on a regional basis. And then we wanna look at, okay, well, if there's a, a kind of a consistent supply of, of food waste going forward into the future, if we believe that's gonna be there, how would we collect it? We don't have mandatory organics collection in our region and currently none of our municipal uh, local governments do either. Austin does, there are examples of that happening across the nation from a statewide perspective, but um, in Texas, that's probably not anything that's gonna happen anytime soon. So how would we look at collecting this, this um, waste product? Um, either on a voluntary basis or some other mechanism. And then look at the demand. So if we have all this food waste, what's the demand from the vehicle side that Lori just talked about um, and, and trying to better quantify that for our region. So we don't wanna go through a lot of effort of, of producing something <laughs> and collecting it if there's not an in, a, a positive in use for that. Of course, always you can produce renewable energy to go back into the grid, but maybe there's another output that we could use it for as well uh, in a beneficial way. Um, similar to projects that are already underway in our. And then looking at um, using UTA's food to flora to fleet fuel model. I know I'm not saying that correctly, but um, Melanie will talk about that here in just a few minutes. But looking at using their model uh, on a regional basis, they've done some case studies for the city of Dallas, but we want to look at plugging all of this information in that we would be gathering from, from our regional perspective and looking at some scenarios from a location perspective, you know, where might be the most optimal locations for digesters and food collection networks um, based on cost, based on supply, based on all different sorts of parameters, and then looking at some of the potential emission benefits that we could get from that as, as well, because that is also one of the key goals that we are working on as a region is complying with ozone non-attainment standards, but then also many of our communities are now uh, and, and partners are really now looking at the climate side and, and greenhouse gas emission side. So looking at what potential benefits may be there for that as well. And so then at the end of the day, um, this 18 month study is what we're thinking that it's going to take us to do this. We would have a study for our region to move forward with in, in a, several different um, areas and, and different ways of, of kind of moving those implementation items or uh, suggestions for next steps forward. I did just throw this in there just kind of as a, a sneak peek at some of the data that we've looked at when we applied for this grant and just a point of reference. Uh, for example, on the food waste side, you know, it's kind of like how much do we actually have in our region and where is it coming from? The top generators here are shown for food manufacturers, food wholesale and retail, restaurants and food services. Uh, and this data is produced by the EPA in a new map that they've developed. Um, over the last year and, and um, issued this map. And so there are there is some data uh, at a very high level 
but this is the type of information that we would be initially looking at to, to gather um, data in our region and potential stakeholders that we would need to move forward and incorporating into this conversation, such as food wholesalers and retailers and distribution centers, so in manufacturers. We do know from our, our compost partners on the waste management side that a lot of manufacturers are already using their food waste in a very positive manner um, for feeding cattle or you know uh, feeding animals, which on the food hierarchy is always really important. Of course, the, the food waste hierarchy, excuse me, um, something that our agency supports as well through our solid waste management areas is really you know feeding people, feeding animals, and, and kind of going down the line on that and composting. But certainly there's still a lot of food being generated um, as this map demonstrates. So that's kind of where we where we are right now. During this grant process, we had a lot of supporters, which hopefully many of them are on the phone. I think they are. And uh, we're going to be pulling all of them together in addition to everyone on the line. If you're interested in continuing to, to be a stakeholder in this effort going forward and looking at expanding that stakeholder group uh, so that we have a diverse input during our study to really look at what could be realistic for our region moving forward and, and really look at establishing partnerships that whether it's the airport or a private sector entity, they could maybe team up with another organization that, that might want to do something similar and share costs or whatever, whatever it may be long term. So more to come on on our topic or our study regionally, um, but today we did want to bring three presenters to share their experiences um, in, in short presentations with everybody and kind of just get this conversation started in our region and, and get some thoughts flowing. So presentations will be posted. I did want to just quickly say this on this conservenorthtexas.org website that's here. So look for this presentation to be posted alongside the presenters presentations once I get those. And I'm going to close this presentation and we can move on to Chris Russell. And while I'm doing that, if you've got any questions, either type it into the chat box or just this is informal. So you're welcome to just unmute yourself and, and ask it as well. OK, so Chris, I see your presentation up, so that's great. OK, so Chris, um, I, I don't hear any questions, so I think you're good to take it away. All right, thank you, Tamara, and uh, thanks, Lori, too, for the little bit of uh, context and setup, and welcome to all of you on the call today. Great that we have a very broad uh, group of uh, stakeholders throughout the region on the call. So what I'd like to do is kind of take you guys through uh, some of the work we've been doing this past year, I guess tied to both the topics of advancing some of our carbon goals and our climate action initiatives as well as uh, to the big elephant in the room on how we're going to deal with our waste issue in our region. And so one of the things uh, we've developed in this past year is we've updated our sustainability management plan to focus on what we're calling six North Star initiatives that will guide DFW Airport through the next decade. And this is a look at what those look like. And what I wanted to call your attention to is, I guess, related to today's call, both the climate action initiatives, which we see very uh, connected to this, the energy performance in terms of uh, sourcing, uh, low cost, economical, uh, you know, solutions, you know, ideally driven through local feedstocks. And then uh, the circular economy. Uh, I think is very closely aligned to what we're talking about today. And of course, uh, you know, the work we're doing at DFW, we want to show our alignment in our advancement of the 17 United Nations Global Sustainable Development Goals. And the first one I thought I'd talk about before we kind of jump into the waste issue is the new work we're doing around climate action. And so DFW has been a carbon neutral airport since 2016. However, in August of this year, we established a new goal to actually achieve net zero carbon by the end of this decade. So this is our, our moonshot, if you will, for climate action. And what you see in this graph, the orange bars represent our carbon footprint. And the green is showing the investments we make in carbon offsets to get to where we are today, which is a carbon neutral uh, airport. However, what we're focused on over this next decade is continuing to reduce our carbon footprint, 
uh, such that in the future, we're going to be looking to carbon removal solutions to ultimately get to uh, net zero in the future. And this graph here just shows uh, where we've been in 2010 when we were 85% of our airport operation was fossil fuel based. And that's all the electricity we buy. That's all the fuels that support transportation. That's the gas that supports our heating uh, and our fire training operation. And so what this really shows is that, uh, you know, a decade ago, we were almost exclusively uh, reliant on fossil fuels. And where you see today, we've completely inverted that. And we're, we're sourcing our energy and our fuels renewably. And really the challenge for us here over the next five to 10 years is how do we uh, solve for the last remaining bit of fossil fuel that we use to source our operation? And so with that, I wanted to jump in now to the circular economy North Star goal, which uh, is the focus of our workshop today. And really what we're doing here is we're taking a very broad look at how we can move from our traditional linear take, make, waste model and go from that to what we're showing here, which is, you know, how do we, how do we close the loop on a lot of the materials that we buy and how can they have a beneficial life after we're done using them for our purpose. And so, uh, you know, why, why organic waste? What's the need here for a project? Well, one of the things to share with you is that uh, the airport itself, I'm sure many of us have seen this even in our, our homes with the, our utility bills, we're seeing rapidly escalating cost due to uh, the cost to haul waste to landfill. And for us, it makes up a sizable component of our uh, budget each year. And that's, that's something that we, we recognize is actually only going to be more of a challenge going forward. And so that's, that's really a key motivator for us is we need to find a way to, you know, how can we maybe, uh, you know, reduce transportation cost? How can we reduce that cost to haul to landfills? And as the capacity that uh, Tamara and Lori mentioned in our region becomes more constrained, and our population continues to increase. We're 8 million today and we're approaching 10 million. It's going to become more and more of an issue. You know, the food, the food waste issue, uh, organic, you know, we don't see local infrastructure today. So I'm really excited about the COGS work to, you know, kind of assess opportunities in our region. And, and it looks like a great partnering opportunity for all of us. And then on the leadership side, you know, as we mentioned, we've set very ambitious North Star goals for the airport. And this is clearly one of our key initiatives. And so a little bit more uh, of a deep dive into, into where we were, kind of where we are on waste. We have a relatively low diversion rate. Um, not one of the things we're super proud of. We're less than 20% of our materials uh, on the municipal solid waste side are diverted to landfill. So there's a big opportunity there to really improve that as we move forward. You know, I mentioned the escalating costs of hauling materials to landfill. That's a big driver for us. And then what I'm going to show you uh, in a minute is a little bit of the data behind uh, really how big of the opportunity we have at DFW around organics. Uh, so one of the things I wanted to show you guys was pre COVID quarantining, we did have a, an effort underway at the beginning of this year to actually do a waste audit on terminal waste. And so this was all of us when uh, we didn't have to social distance and we, we got together and we took a deep dive literally into all the waste that gets generated at our, at our terminals. And this is the, uh, the glamorous photo of what that looks like. Uh, this is about an hour of waste generated at one of our terminals. Uh, so uh, there's a lot of materials, about 30,000 tons a year get generated from DFW. So a lot, a lot of uh, opportunity here. And this is really the findings from that work that we did on that audit. And, you know, key to our discussion in this workshop today is on organics. And what we identified is depending on the terminal that we looked at, uh, there was anywhere from uh, 15 to over 20% of our materials in our waste by weight was organics. 
And so we see that as a, as a tremendous way for us to really uh, improve our diversion rates, you know, lower our cost of landfill. And that's, that's really a key focus uh, for where we want to go in this next year. And so I've uh, kind of broken down the solutioning uh, that, that we're working on into kind of three categories, if you will. So the first one, this one's my favorite because I deal with this at home every day um, with my family. It's what I call the behavioral solution. And, uh, you know, this is the challenge we all face, and especially us at the airport. If we have 200,000 people traveling through our airport on a given day, we have 65,000 employees in the airport. Uh, how, how do we incentivize and how do we really get the buy-in for all of those individuals to make the right choices around disposing of materials? And so these are a couple of uh, examples of uh, kind of what we've done and what we've been working on. What you see on the left is actually a reverse vending machine that we've deployed actually in our headquarters. And we're looking to uh, put some in the terminals as well. And so, you know, that that's something that you can use to actually collect a clean recyclable and generate a clean waste stream that can not only generate some good uh, rebates back to you, but really, you know, like I say, drive some of the uh, positive behaviors that we're really looking for. The middle photo there is just showing a display that we built in partnership with Coca-Cola. And again, the idea there was we wanted to, to really sort of drive some interest into recycling and, you know, hopefully be able to show some of the products that you can make with recycled bottles in the future. And then on the left is actually one of my favorite ones, very simple solution, which was we actually changed the colors and the labeling on our, all of our uh, waste bins in the terminals. And we went to a color scheme. Uh, many of you may have been using already, but uh, we went to a color scheme, which was we used the color black to represent what's going to the landfill. And we put some simple icons on there to kind of help communicate you know, what really goes in this side of the bin. And then we tried to simplify the mixed recyclables. And in this case, we went to a blue color and we noted that what, we, what we're looking for is just bottles and cans. And again, we're trying to make it as simple as possible uh, so that when someone walks up, you know, they're in a rush, not really paying attention. We're trying to make uh, the right behavior, the behavior we're looking for, the easiest behavior. The other solution that uh, we're pilot testing, and we actually just received uh, this, uh, what you see on the screen here, is a it's a it's a automated uh, waste bin that uses uh, camera technology and machine learning to actually look at the material. So the idea is that a you know the customers that I mentioned, the you know the, the employees, you can simply put whether it's a waste or a recyclable material into one opening and let a robotic solution look at that material and make a decision on whether that goes in the waste side or whether that's a recyclable material. So a good example is, you know, you throw a, a half full water bottle, you know, into the waste stream. Well, that cannot be recycled due to the liquid contained content. So you know, the, the AI would make the decision that, well, because it has water in it, this is going to landfill so that it does not contaminate our, our clean waste stream. And so this is something we're pilot testing in one of the terminals. And, you know, I've seen some other solutions at other large facilities where the, you know, the bin itself has some, some informational, instructional, educational uh, materials to kind of help make, make this right decision. But what we really like about this is that you don't have to make a decision. You just simply put the material in and we rely on technology to sort it correctly. So this is exciting. And, you know, where we see this going forward is we, we absolutely could uh, use this same type of technology to sort out compostables and, and really make a, a, three, a three stream solution in the future. Today, what we have at DFW is just two streams but we're actively trying to work on how do we build a, uh, a consistent uh, organic food stream. So the other solution uh, is kind of how do we fix some of our processes? 
And so one of the things we're, we're working on is securing a new contract that can, you know, take a organic uh, waste stream from say a concession, like you see on the left and, and, and bring that to either a local farm, which Tamara mentioned, supporting uh, animals on those farms. It could go to what you see on the right, which is a compost facility just south of Dallas, south of the Macomas Bluff landfill. And so, you know, trying to get these materials from kitchens and food prep areas that are clean, organic waste streams and create a, a successful process that you can haul, capture and haul those materials to support, you know, local beneficial reuses in our region. The last uh, one here to share with you guys is probably the most challenging and, and that's due to the uh, capital investment that's required but it's the technology solution. And so what you see here is really uh, the outcome of a sort of an initial feasibility assessment that we did over this past summer. Tamara mentioned that early, earlier. And what we looked at is DFW is generating about 7,000 tons of organic waste materials a year from our, our total waste stream. And so what type of technology could help? Could we actually locate construct on site and could actually handle that 7,000 tons of organics per year and not only create a, say, a beneficial soil amendment that we could uh, sell or, you know, you know find a, a beneficial use on site, but also uh, back to one of the things Lori was discussing, which is the generation of renewable natural gas. And so this is a example of a uh, what's called a, a dry digestion technology and kind of much like your garage, what you see there in the photo is like a garage door, if you will, that you would open, you would print, you would uh, haul the organic materials in, let the magic happen. And then you see kind of the bubble on top where it's collecting the methane. And then the methane then is brought over to what you see on the right, cleaned up, and then ideally injected into the natural gas distribution system and support, you know, the advancement of RNG through this food stock. So with that, I think uh, I, will, I will end the presentation. I do have some more details on our feasibility study that I've sort of thrown on the back end of this deck. And Tamara, I will send that over to you and Lori to share with the group uh, for those that maybe want to take a deeper dive into the dry digestion kind of solution that we worked on. Okay, awesome. That sounds great, Chris. So many cool things that I did not even know existed, like robot trash separators. <laughs> so that really neat opportunities there. And yes, we will certainly get, get those presentations posted for anybody that wants to go back to them. Um, and Chris, you have a couple of questions in the chat box. I think uh, Zoe maybe was answering, or Sarah was answering a few of them, sorry, but just FYI, we're going to, I'm going to skip over those for right now so in the interest of time so that Matt can get started on his presentations. But if you have a t chance, I know you've got to leave in just a, a few minutes. If you can answer those, that would be great. But thank you so much for your time and sharing where the airport is right now. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. So up next, um, right Matt now. Sheldon with uh, Toyota, uh, he's with the Toyota Social Innovation Group, or sorry, the Toyota's Environmental Business Partnering Group out of the Plano headquarters office. So um, we're happy to have Toyota here today to share uh, what they're working on. So uh, yes, uh, thank you very much for uh, inviting me and putting this, uh, putting this together. Um, I'm joined together with Kelly Gregory, who's on our inclusive mobility team. Uh, she looks at uh, clean energy mobility uh, projects, along with Lori McMahon and Government Affairs. I also have um, two of our collaborators who helped um, work work on um, our study over the summer. We have uh, SMU, uh, the Hunt School of Engineering. On the line, we have uh, Dr. Eva Chalky and uh, graduate student, uh, Harshada Pednekar. And then we also have uh, Juan, from uh, Energia. Uh, it's a, a company that's uh, based out of California, but with operations world, worldwide. Um, they'll be on for, for questions towards the end. 
So again, um, I'm Matt Sheldon. I'm from our um, our employee resource group called Terra. It's similar to what PepsiCo has with PepsiCo Green. And we have about 300 people in our employee resource group um, from across the company. We'll be going over some of our environmental goals, similar to what the airport, very much aligned to what the FW Airport just presented. Some, some of what we did for uh, our waste audit and, uh, and the study with SMU uh, and then the recommendations. So just to... Uh, Set, set similar to the airport, we have six six goals around uh, different areas from from water, biodiversity, um, and carbon. I won't go into much detail on that because probably spend uh, an hour or two on that subject. Um, but we do have environmental port if you want to find out what we do in each area. But within that, we have four focus areas: uh, carbon, water, materials, and biodiversity that we that we focus on. And those similar similar to what was presented, those are aligned with uh, UN SDGs um, as well. So how this project began, um, you know, we we're sitting around in one of our conference rooms pre-COVID um, talking about our recycling rate and uh, it's below 50%. And, you know, there's a lot of complaining. What could we do about what could we do about this issue? Um, so we, similar to the airport, implemented an end-to-end -end audit. We, we did it, and along with that, we, on campus, we, we did a few things. We uh, did a new, initiated a new recycling program and then put all of our uh, compost um, into collection and centralized that to our cafeterias, taking that out of um, some of our uh, other office areas so that we could control the contamination. But despite that, uh, our food, a lot of our uh, waste continued to be rejected. So we wanted to find out why. We also, at that same time, switched um, our single-use items, one-time items from plastic to fibers or bioplastics, and now it's all right now being sent to landfill. It's a similar issue that other companies, uh, I know, you know Frito-Lay, Pepsi has the same same issue. Um, so we have this new new waste stream, but no no way to no way to compost it, um, and there's no, we don't know of any corporate campus in Plano that's effectively able to compost. All of their, I put in quotes here, compostable materials. All it's all ending up in landfill. I think you people on the call know the reason for that is, it's uh, you know for the for the compost uh, here this has a 60 day turn turn rate versus what it takes for bioplastics to break down or PLA materials to break down, and um, it's also hard to identify whether or not that is uh, you know plastic or bioplastic. So as I said before, we centralized our food waste into the collection area and we conducted an end-to-end -end audit. But during that audit, we discovered a, a bigger issue and that, that was that there was no campus, no corporate campus that uh, was in compliance with the city of Plano in terms of being able to use, uh, use that compost facility. It was all, it's all being sent uh, to another, another compost facility that has more tolerance for contamination. So our overall goal is to be zero, uh, zero waste certified. We're looking to be above the 90% 90% level. And we're looking for a solution that accounts not just for food waste, but also can handle fibrous materials and bioplastics, uh, a system that has some a design with some tolerance for contamination. As uh, the airport said there, you know, Changing, changing people's behaviors is, diff is difficult. You can rely on technology and other things, but mistakes do happen. Um, and if there's no tolerance built into the system, it just will continue to be rejected. And then we're also looking for something that, you know, obviously can eliminate greenhouse gases. So what we, what our study and what we looked at over the summer was um, an anaerobic digester that incorporates a system capable of bio, handling bioplastics, other fibrous materials, and importantly has um, tolerance for, for contamination. And a system that can not only create renewable natural gas, but for us, hydrogen is also um, an important part of the puzzle. So on the right, you can see some of the growth in bioplastics. So not only did Toyota switch out to bioplastics or PLA or fibrous materials, but our neighbor Frito-Lay also did the same thing. We think this can, this trend will continue in the area um, and more and more companies. And so we do need a, a, a solution that can handle, can handle this new waste stream. We did, uh, together with SME, we did an academic review. We looked at more of the, what 
what studies were out there that talked about bio di uh, about digestion with of PLA uh, materials. Um, so there's a, a number of studies out there that have looked at this, a few that have implemented it. And so we know that it exists, it, it can work, and we think it should be part of an overall solution that, that, that looks at, you know, for the, for the region. Some of the key questions we looked at for our study were, um, and I'll, I'm happy to share this before the next meeting, is it feasible to incorporate PLA biodegradable plastics into a digester on an industrial scale? Uh, how much feedstock is available? I'll show some of those numbers in a minute. Um, should we create a new digester or tap into existing existing capacity at a wastewater treatment plant? There was a study that was done in California with that exact same, with that exact same thing. Um, what's the smallest scale that we can do this on? Associated cost. We actually have a breakdown of of all of that as well. Um, the economies of scale, scaling up from 10 to 100 tons per day. Uh, what that looks like from an incremental investment. Uh, the environmental improvements, um, some of the greenhouse gas reduction, how much RNG can be created, how many vehicles can be fueled, and some of the co uh, economics around it, revenue generated costs, equipment, ongoing, ongoing CapEx, et cetera. So this is kind of some of the findings that we, you know, not all of them, just at a top, a top level. So on a 10 to 12 ton a day digester with about 8 to 10 percent contamination, we estimated that we could produce around 200 kilograms a day of, of hydrogen. And that would be a, enough to fuel a fleet, we estimated, of, of about 200 Mirai vehicles. And then we also looked at the greenhouse gas reduction um, from PLA materials. So we know that on top of the, the benefit of food waste, there's also an additional benefit by diverting uh, these PLA materials. And our campus alone, uh, we, we generate about 1.5 million pounds or 769 tons annually of food waste. And we know the city of Plano um, has about 30,000 tons of yard waste annually. Um, and so we know that just with Toyota and the city of Plano, that we can support a 10 ton a day digester. But that doesn't even factor in all of the other companies in the area. I think one of the early questions you posed was, you know, the opportunity for doing this at residential. And I think that poses a lot of um, challenges, but I think one of the easier or lower hanging fruit areas, if you will, is with corporate campuses. Um, we collect our, our compost, Frito-Lay does the same thing. The other companies um, in the area also do that as well. Um, and we have pretty low contamination rates. And so just starting off with corporate campuses and with figuring what, our, what the yard waste is out there, I, it's my view that this is already feasible. Um, it's just a matter of when, where, and where and how. So let me get into the how for a moment. That's a different presentation. So let me just stop sharing this for a second. So then we, we spoke with, uh, with Energia and we have uh, Juan on the line to answer some questions about this, about how we actually could do this. Um, and so they're, they're a global company. I don't want to speak too much for him and he can, he can um, this will be available after um, as well for to download. But they, they operate all over the world, the, these, uh, these uh, plants. And we know that from some of the studies they've, they've shown and, and that have been done in California, one of the main places is uh, for, for methane uh, emitters is, is in, uh, is landfill. But when we talk about how to do this, when we when incorporation of PLA or bioplastics into this, one of the first things that needs to be done is, is it needs to be uh, shredded, um, separated. Um, and so there's different types of different types of ways to do that. And so there this is some some of the some of that equipment in here to separate it, take care of some of that contamination, and then treat it. So there's different ways to do some pretreatment of the uh, of PLA materials to help it break down or bioplastics to help it, and to um, separate it. And as the as we do that, you know, we can it, it's uh, you know basically it's feasible. This is some of their some of their calculations as well. So treated bioplastics with some contamination can produce up to 450 uh, biogas um, and about 
60% of food waste. Uh, maybe I have uh, Juan speak a little bit more on, on that, um, if you have some questions about exactly how that can happen. But um, we, we laid it out, and it, and it it doesn't need to be all implemented at one time. You, it's possible to do this in puzzle pieces. For instance, if you just wanted to do the PLA materials or bioplastics, there's you could implement that together with the wastewater treatment plant. Um, on the back end, you could implement just the a hydrogen component as well. And so there's different kind of ways to, to do this. So some of my questions and what I'm hoping to get out of this is, you know, I think we've each done different types of studies. Can we help fast track some of the work to help put a solution in place, um, at least for some of the corporate campuses that also takes care of this new this new waste stream? That's kind of it for me. OK, great. Thank you, Matt. It was a great overview. I didn't realize y'all were at the stage of actually knowing kind of the size of, of a digester that you could support with just your facility and, and the city of Plano's organics as well. So that's really interesting data that I think moving forward we could definitely incorporate. And I really like the idea of kind of focusing on the corporate, kind of these major like areas in our region where there's a high percentage of major kind of corporate conglomerations of yeah. buildings and things as kind of uh, maybe some nodes that we could look at. So I think that's a really interesting concept kind of moving things I think, forward. Right. I think because we have more control over it than, you know, obviously at a someone at home that we can provide uh, a pretty when we can provide a pretty well uh, something that's predictable mm -hmm. and with with um, pretty good quality. So, um, yeah, I think that that would be a good way to start. Great. OK, well, um, I'm going to we've got about 10 minutes or so left um, to uh, have Mel. I don't know if anybody had questions for Matt um, in the chat box. I don't I'm not seeing any right this second. So I think uh, if you've got questions for Matt, feel free to post them. I think he can stay on the line and hopefully help answer those. I think uh, Melanie, I, if you can share yours, I don't know if you were going to have slides or not. Um, are you going? Yes. OK. OK, so does it show up? Yes, ma'am. You are good okay, to so go. We're going to talk about the food flora waste to fleet fuel, which we abbreviate as F4 framework. So I'm speaking on behalf of my colleagues that helped develop this and Arpita Bot is on the line. Our work was funded by Center for Transportation Equity Decisions and Dollars or CTED, which is funded by US Department of Transportation. And COG was a stakeholder in the project as well as City of Dallas. So the objectives of the framework are to help cities or regions assess economic feasibility of using wastewater treatment plant digesters for converting food and flora or yard waste to fleet fuel. Uh, that can be electricity or compressed natural gas. So the idea is to try to take advantage of existing infrastructure. Uh, the, the digesters in the region that Tamara talked about that already exist uh, if they have excess capacity, uh, they could potentially accommodate food and yard waste, and that saves um, the expense of having to build a new digester. The framework also is designed to help cities and regions select optimal wastewater treatment plant digesters when more than one is available. And it does this by balancing transportation versus fuel generation cost. So we'll talk more about that in a minute. But the framework has four basic parts. Uh, the first one is GIS that aggregates food yard waste to be collected. In this iteration of the framework, it's a set of instructions, but we're going to be working on version 2.0 of the framework. And in the new version of it, um, we're going to automate that process. The second part is the basic tool itself, which is an Excel spreadsheet. The third part, oh, the, the Excel spreadsheet, the outputs include the amount of electricity or CNG that you could generate and the uh, project cost benefits, among other things. Uh, third part is optimization extension. And this is the piece, it's Python code that helps determine optimal wastewater treatment plant digester candidates. 
And then the fourth piece is a guidebook that we developed to answer questions of cities that may be thinking about digesting food or yard waste. So I'm not going to cover that in the presentation here, but I'd be glad to send you a copy uh, for anybody who's interested. All right, so the GIS process. Uh, the categories of food waste that the process covers um, include single family households, educational institutions, restaurants, etc. And for yard waste, uh, we have single family households, golf courses, parks, and commercial lawns. Uh, I know there's a lot going on on this slide, but I wanted to um, show a little bit of the detail as to how the GIS is coming up with the estimates of the food waste. So if we look at the first line, we have single family households. And we had a number from SWANA, which is Solid Waste Association of North America, that says that on average across the US, each household generates five pounds of food waste per week. So if we multiply that five pounds by the number of single family households we have in a census tract, which is called a block group, then we can get the food waste from that block group from single family houses. And so we did a uh, study for a city of Dallas, and this is an example of the GIS map that we came out with. Uh, so this is food waste from single family homes, and it's aggregated by census block group. Uh, so the, the units here are pounds per week, so we actually haven't converted that to per year yet. And the, the darker the shading, the more food waste is generated in that block group. If we go back one more time to this table, I wanted to highlight one other line. Um, here on the, the large um, dark shaded line, uh, I don't know if you can see my cursor, I'm trying to point, but um, we use the EPA excess food opportunities map that Tamara mentioned earlier which has a lot of good institution specific institution specific information for a lot of different categories of food waste um, and that includes restaurants so you can go into the epa excess food opportunities database and look up your favorite restaurant in city of dallas and it'll tell you how much food waste is generated in tons per year so we did that and we aggregated the waste by census block group again and so here's an example of the GIS map that we came out with. So this was for restaurants in city of Dallas um, with the food waste aggregated by census block group. So when we added up the food waste and the yard waste from all the different sources, uh, this is what we got. So this is a resulting map of food and yard waste by block group for city of Dallas. And again, in the next version of our um, framework, we uh, expect to automate this process. All right, so second part of the tool, or second part of the framework is the basic tool. And this is an Excel spreadsheet. It utilizes eight different inputs. So the first one is what we just saw from the GIS, the massive food and yard waste. Um, you need transport distance to the landfill or the digester. So the tool uses landfill as a baseline. So it compares cost uh, for digesting food and yard waste to cost of um, disposing of it in the landfill. And then you need some information about the digester, the wastewater treatment plant digester, and then a few other pieces of information. Uh, so it's eight inputs. And the EPA has an anaerobic digester cost tool that's called COEAT, and it requires 78 different inputs. So ours is a screening tool. Uh, we designed it on purpose to have many fewer inputs to make it more user-friendly. Uh, the outputs that you get from the tool are digester expansion volume, if that's required, the volume of biogas generated, electricity or CNG that you can generate from the biogas, the miles the vehicles can travel on the renewable fuel, 
emission reductions, and then cost benefits. So the tools developed by uh, one of our grad students did surveys and phone interviews with operational managers of 17 wastewater treatment plants with anaerobic digesters. So these were not just in Texas, they were around the country. And truck manufacturers, fleet managers, waste collection company personnel, uh, we had a couple of UTA faculty members, as well as a consultant that provided particular expertise concerning digester design, foundation costs, and construction costs. And then the, the graduate student worked really hard and reviewed over 150 pieces of literature. So the basic tool is an Excel screening tool, it has limited inputs. Time frame is 50 years, so it looks at cost benefits over a 50 year time frame with 2% interest rate, which was the average for the last 10 years um, in the US. Cells are color coded to help the users. Uh, yellow is a mandatory input. Uh, the brown or dark orange is an optional input and then the outputs are in green. Uh, and you see listed here the types of vehicles that can be operated using the electricity or the CNG. The third piece is the optimization extension. So this is the piece that balances transportation costs with capital cost to figure out what's the ideal uh, location of digesters. So you see an example in the figures here. On the left, we have one centrally located digester uh, with the red star in the middle. And in this case, we would have a low capital cost. So you just have one site. So in terms of installing uh, equipment to upgrade the biogas to fuel and installing refueling stations, you have lower cost. Um, on the other hand, you have greater transportation costs because everything has to be transported to this one central location. On the right hand side, we have a situation where we have five different digesters spread out. So in this case, you'd have a higher capital cost because you'd need upgrading equipment and refueling stations at five locations, but the transport distances would be shorter. So transportation costs would be lower. Uh, so what the extension does is helps figure out what would be the optimal scenario. So we use the parts of the framework to do case study for the city of Dallas. So Dallas right now has two wastewater treatment plants. Uh, Central, which does not have a digester, and Southside, which does. Um, there used to be a digester at Central and Dallas removed it for various reasons. And so this was really a theoretical case study just to demonstrate that the, the framework worked. Uh, but we evaluated using digesters at two locations. So adding one back at Dallas Central and using the existing one at Southside and then just expanding the capacity at Southside. So for the amount of waste that we considered, the existing capacity was not enough. So some capacity would have to be added somewhere. Uh, so we looked at the 50 year time frame. The amount of food and yard waste that we looked at was 33% of Dallas food waste. And that number comes from a national estimate of food waste that could not be used to feed hungry people. Um, so Tamara talked about the food waste recovery hierarchy, uh, but this is the, the national percent that couldn't be used for hungry people. And then we use 31% of yard waste to send to the digester, and that comes from a national number of the amount of yard waste that's landfilled. So we said rather than sending it to a landfill, we'll send it to a digester. We considered digester operating cost only for the extra food and yard waste that we would send, not the existing cost for the sludge. And we considered use of the biogas from the food and yard waste. So again, the additional biogas that would be generated. And we assumed that would be used to generate electricity for garbage trucks. All right, so the optimization extension results 
Um, there's kind of a lot of numbers here, but basically we have the facility cost and these are for the digester expansion, a grinder. So that's pre-processing the food and yard waste so it can be digested. And then the biogas conversion costs for upgrading to the electricity. And when we look at the scenario with the two digester locations, uh, you can see that the cost is a little bit greater than the scenario with the one um, digester location. Hopefully you can see my, my arrow pointing on the screen here. In terms of the transportation cost for the 50 years, we see a much greater difference. So for the scenario where we had the two locations, we have $59 billion transportation cost over 50 years, but $101 billion if we just have the one location. So the total cost then is driven by the transportation cost and they're much cheaper for the two locations. And so that's the more favorable scenario. So the basic tool then allowed us for the two digester scenario to estimate volume of biogas that would be generated per day, the amount of electricity that could be generated from the biogas, uh, the miles that the electric garbage trucks could travel per year on the electricity, number of garbage trucks that could operate on the electricity, and then the emission reductions from operating the garbage trucks on electricity as opposed to the current diesel. So got a cost benefit table. Um, I'm gonna just skip past that in the interest of time and get to the bottom line. Uh, bottom line is that sending the food and yard waste to the digester could save $28 billion over 50 years compared with the current scenario, which is the landfilling. Um, and the cost savings there are driven primarily by savings in the transport cost. So the landfill is farther away than the digesters. Um, but there are some costs due or benefits due to saving landfill space and savings in terms of diesel fuel. All right, so the F4 framework will be used in the upcoming EPA project. Uh, as Tamara was mentioning, um, to expand the case study. So we're going to expand from City of Dallas to look at a case study for the entire North Central Texas region and use the optimization extension to look at optimal sites for food organic waste digestion. And we can look at the existing wastewater treatment plants with digesters um, already, but the tool also allows, as you saw, building of new digesters. So we can also consider new locations. And we can use the tool to estimate the different outputs that you just saw in the City of Dallas case study. All right, and we'd like to thank CTED for providing the funding for the work on the project so far. Thank you, Melanie. Um, if anybody has any questions for Melanie, feel free to put them in the chat box or, or just chime in here and ask. I think that was a great segue to kind of the next five minutes of our, our agenda here. I, I realized I spoke way too long at the beginning, so I apologize that I ate up a lot of our discussion time. Um, but the good news is, is that this conversation isn't over. Um, as Melanie stated, uh, we, in a, as a reminder, we, we will be working on this topic more specifically through some efforts funded by EPA. It is estimated at this point that we will have that award in the springtime sometime. EPA has indicated um, around the March timeframe. So between now and then, our goal uh, is really to start making these connections like we are doing on the phone today. We have a great, awesome group of stakeholders already on the line. We've got McDonald's, we have Frito-Lay, we have PepsiCo, we have the airport, all of our, our local governments that are interested in this topic, Dallas um, and, and universities. So I think we have a really good start to, to building kind of a coalition or stakeholder group to, to move these conversations forward. A lot of these projects that Matt talked about from Toyota's perspective and, and the airport talked about really hinge on potential partnerships um, even, and, and we wanna be lo looking at those through our study efforts as well. And, and what sort of partnerships can we form with industry or the restaurant industry 
uh, or corporate <laughs> areas that have, you know, a whole lot of corporate buildings. So look at some different strategies in, in our study as well. So I'm going to just open it up for the next couple minutes. If anybody has any thoughts, questions, ideas, uh, I wrote a lot of notes. Please type them in or just weigh in with them. Hey, Tamara, this is Chris from DFW Airport. I'm, I was able to stay on. So I was going to make, a, I guess, a follow-up note, and it sounds similar to Matt's experience at Toyota, which is sort of our feasibility analysis pointed to the fact that we don't generate enough organics to really make the business case for an anaerobic digester without a partner. So I think similar to what Matt, you shared about having, you know, say Plano as a community partner, uh, we're really in the same boat at the airport where really we need to find, uh, you know, a community partner that could help us. And, and that would really make it feasible. The, uh, some of the results that uh, the team we hired pointed to is that really the cost, uh, it, it doesn't change that much once you get a certain minimum threshold. Uh, the key is to try to get to that threshold uh, to really make the, you know, the capital investment uh, business case. Yeah, I, I found the same thing. So I actually have the numbers um, from a, for a 10 ton a day up to 100 ton and the it's like an additional like 10 million just to go from a 10 ton a day to 100 ton. That's just because the the size of the equipment um, doesn't scale scale down. So, um, you know, it has much once you buy the equipment, you can you can scale it up without much incremental investment. So um, I'm happy to share that with you. Yeah, that'd be awesome. And then one note I was just going to share on because uh, I feel like I didn't give RNG its due its due uh, time, but um, just to give you an example at DFW, I posted a couple of notes in the chat in a pre-COVID year with our, our large bus operation. Uh, we rely on about three hundred thousand uh, cubic feet of gas a year to power the fleet. So we're just in the last few months, we're up to about 75% of our supply is RNG. Um, so we're, I guess, progressing. The, uh, I guess when you look at it on a diesel gallon equivalent, my energy team tells me it's somewhere, uh, we're only paying about 50 cents to 75 cents for diesel gallon equivalent. So it's an absolute no brainer when it's used in transportation. Uh, when it's used in stationary facilities, like uh, I mentioned in the chat with the central utility plant, uh, then, then it becomes a really big issue because without the EPA renewable fuel standard incentives, uh, it, it's just very, very costly, like a four times multiplier over uh, just gas coming via pipeline. So just a couple of notes on the, the RNG side. Awesome. Great. Thank you, Chris. This roundtable and this initial discussion really demonstrated for me um, the possibilities that we may be able to um, look at from a regional perspective and maybe using some of the models that um, Toyota looked at and Chris looked at at the airport um, and kind of expanding upon those um, in our regional study. If you, I, I do want to make a plea for anyone on the line that thinks that there are other stakeholders that need to be involved in this conversation to please let me know so that we can get them involved and, and woven into this conversation as we move forward you know wherever they fall on that spectrum from organics to vehicle use um, and vehicle fuel because it is all related with this type of a study um, and, and i would anticipate that we would be scheduling another roundtable discussion like this probably uh, realistically in the February timeframe next year to continue moving these discussions forward. So I hope that uh, you all would be open to continuing to participate in these discussions. Um, and as we uh, move forward with our actual execution of our EPA grant, kind of further defining who that key stakeholder group is so that we have a diverse organizations represented from our region that really have an interest in this topic um, area and uh, a vested um, kind of, in, not an incentive, but an interest uh, in continuing to see where we could take this from a regional perspective. So 
Um, I'm excited about it. I'm so thrilled that we had our speakers join us today. I'm excited to work with UTA going forward as well. Um, but please, um, if you've got any ideas, just weigh in. I'm happy to hang on the line for a little while. Also, I think Lori had to jump off, so I know she presented on the RNG side. So if anybody's got any questions for her, please um, feel free to follow up with her. I'm, I just noticed that she wasn't on anymore. Um, so uh, if you've got any questions, I'm happy to hang on. Otherwise, um, feel free to, we are adjourned. Um, and we will continue these discussions in the February timeframe.